Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here during the midweek service to just honor and worship you. We give you the glory and just pray that you use this message here tonight to just honor and glorify you and that people might get something out of it and it might touch each and every one here tonight. We pray for safety for each and every one and we just ask your blessings on the service. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Tonight we're going to read through Nehemiah chapter 3. Now I'm going to read the whole chapter quickly and then I'm going to just hit some highlights on some important things uh, as we get along here. So Nehemiah chapter 3. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They sanctified it and set up the doors of it. Even unto the tower of Mia, they sanctified it, and the tower of Hananiel. And next unto him builded the men of Jericho. And next to them builded Zachur, the son of Emery. But the fish gate did the sons of Hassaniah build, who also laid the beams thereof, and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. And next unto them repaired Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Kaz. And next unto them repaired Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, the son of Meshashabil. And next unto them repaired Zadok, the son of Anna. And next unto them the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles put not their necks to the work of the Lord. Moreover, to the old gate repaired Jehoiada, the son of Paseah, and Meshulam, the son of Besodiah. They laid the beans thereof, and set up the doors thereof, and the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. And next unto them repaired Melatia the Gibeonite, and Jadon the Meronthite, the men of Gibeon, and of Mizpah, under the throne of the governor on this side of the river. Next unto him repaired Uziel, the son of Herahira, of the goldsmiths. Next unto him also repaired Hananiah, the son of one of the apothecaries, and they fortified Jerusalem under the broad wall. And next unto them repaired Raphia, the son of Hur, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem. And next unto them repaired Jedediah, the son of Haram, even over against his house. And next unto him repaired Hattush, the son of Hasabniah. Malkijah, the son of Haram and Hashu, the son of Pehath Moab, repaired the other piece in the tower of the furnaces. And next unto him repaired Shalom, the son of Halahesh, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem, he and his daughter. The valley gate repaired Hanan and the inhabitants of Zenoa. They built it and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof and the bars thereof and a thousand cubits on the wall unto the dung gate. But the dung gate repaired Machia the son of Rechab, the ruler of part of Beth Hasaram. He built it and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. But the gate of the fountain repaired Shalom, the son of Kohasso, the ruler of part of Mizpah. He built it and covered it and set up the doors thereof the locks thereof, and the bars thereof, and the wall of the pool of Siloah by the king's garden, and unto the stairs that go down from the city of David. And after him repaired Nehemiah the son of Azbu, the ruler of the half part of Bethzer, unto the place over against the sepulchres of David, and to the pool that was made, and unto the house of the mighty. After him repaired the Levites, Rehem the son of Bani. Next unto him repaired Hashabiah, the ruler of the half part of Kela, and his part. After him repaired their brethren, Bavi the son of Hanadad, the ruler of the half part of Kela. And next to him repaired Ezer, the son of Jeshua, the ruler of Mizpah, another piece over against the going up to the armory at the turning of the wall. After him, Baruch the son of Zabai earnestly repaired the other piece from the turning of the wall unto the door of the house of Elishib. The high priest. After him repaired Merimoth, the son of Elijah, the son of Kaz, another piece from the door of the house of Elishib, even to the end of the house of Elishib. And after him repaired the priests, the men of the plain. After him repaired Benjamin and Hashub over against their house. After him repaired Azariah, the son of 
Masiah, the son of Ananiah, by his house. After him repaired Benu, the son of Henadad, another piece from the house of Azariah, unto the turning of the wall, even unto the corner. Palal, the son of Uzai, over against the turning of the wall, and the tower which lieth out from the king's high house, that was by the court of the prison, after him Padiah the son of Parash. Moreover, the Nethanims dwelt in Ophel, under the place over against the water gate toward the east, and the tower that lieth out. After them the Tekoites repaired another piece over against the great tower that lieth out, even under the wall of Ophel. From above the horse gate repaired the priests, every one over against his house. After them repaired Zadok the son of Emmer over against his house. After him repaired also Shemiah the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate. After him repaired Hananiah the son of Shalamiah, and Hanun the sixth son of Zalah, another piece. After him repaired Meshulam the son of Berechiah over against his chamber. After him repaired Malchiah the goldsmith's son, unto the place of the Nethanims, and of the merchants over against the gate Mithkat, and to the going up of the corner. And between the going up of the corner, under the sheep gate, repaired the goldsmiths and the merchants. Now tonight my sermon titled, Nehemiah 3 and the Ten Gates of the Jerusalem Wall. Now I read that whole chapter to you for a reason, you know, I'm going to, you'll see here in a little bit why I'm going to, you know, I read it, but... Nehemiah 3, as we just read, tells of the ten gates of, of Jerusalem walls. They are rebuilt by the Jews who returned to Jerusalem after the Medo-Persian Empire defeated the Babylonian Empire. After the end of the Babylonian Empire, the Persian king Cyrus allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And it is believed by some that Cyrus was part Jewish. This rebuilt temple is sometimes referred to as Zerubbabel's temple, since Zerubbabel was the governor and leader of Judah, who led a group of Jews from Babylon to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. You can read about that in 2 Chronicles 36, verses 22 through 23. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him an house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. Nehemiah led the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem and the gates. Each of the ten gates has a meaning, and, and God had them rebuilt them in a specific order for a reason. And we're gonna you'll see this as I go along here. Each of the each of the gates in some way points to Jesus or our relationship to him. The ten gates listed are built in a counterclockwise order from the north wall, starting with the sheep gate. Notice where the gates are located and what they represent. Just as numbers and colors in Scripture have meaning, so do compass directions in Scripture such as north, west, south, and east. And the gates will show them those meanings. North represents death as all are born spiritually dead. Thus the sheep gate brings salvation. West rep represents harvest of the seed as seen in the fish gate as fishers of men win souls. South represents life as the dung gate cleanses sin from us. And East means Jesus Christ as seen in the various gates of the East, such as the second coming of Jesus in the East Gate. The circumference of the ten gates was approximately 2.5 miles or two and a half miles. And it closed about 220 acres. You know, the original old city was not very big. People of all backgrounds and occupations helped rebuild the wall and gates, just as the Church of God and the Body of Christ is made up of a diverse background of people and occupations, and Jesus wants all to work for Him. You know, not just certain people or certain age groups or whatever. If you're a Christian, God wants everybody to work for Him. 
And you see this in, represented in these gates. It's just, as I said, there was various, there was uh, leaders of the government. There was, uh, you know, priests. There was goldsmiths and so forth, apothecaries, whatnot. Modern Jerusalem only has eight gates. They are the New Gate, Damascus Gate, Herod's Gate, Lion's Gate, the Golden Gate, which is sealed up, the Dumb Gate, Zion Gate, and the Jaffa Gate. The New Jerusalem that will be coming in the future will have 12 gates, three on each side, which will be named for the 12 tribes of Israel. You can read about that in Revelation 21, verses 12 through 13. And had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east, three gates, on the north, three gates, on the south, three gates, and on the west, three gates. The wall of Nehemiah's day may have had ten gates, since number ten represents the law, and the purpose of the law is to show us that we are sinners and to point us to Jesus as each of the gates did. You know, and I think that might be some reason why the number, there's 12 gates in the future, because 12 is governmental perfection, and under Jesus it's perfect, so that might be why there's 12, you know, plus all the 12 tribes, which is why they probably have 12 tribes to begin with. And then I think maybe it's possible that the number 8, and why we have 8 gates today, is uh, 8 represents a new beginning. Well, in one sense, Israel had a new beginning, you know, with being a new nation and so forth. It was given another chance again after the destruction back in AD 70. But that, I can't prove it. That, that's speculation. The first gate that was rebuilt on the wall surrounding Jerusalem was the Sheep Gate. Read about that in verses 1 and 2. The gate was rebuilt by the priests. Nehemiah 3.1 says... Then Elishib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They sanctified it, and set up the doors of it. Even under the tower of Mia, they sanctified it unto the tower of Hananiel. The sheep gate represents salvation, with it representing Jesus, who as the Lamb of God is the only way of salvation. The sheep gate was the only gate that was sanctified. To be holy as it represents salvation from Jesus. This gate pointed to the first coming of Jesus who died for us on that cross, was buried, rose again on the third day from the grave so that we may have salvation. John 1.29 says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. John 14, 6 says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We must always start with concern for the salvation of the lost, for without salvation it does not matter what a person does. Without salvation, a person, no matter how good they are, will spend eternity in hell and the lake of fire. The lost must enter the sheep gate in order to pass through the door of Jesus in order to be saved. The priests understood the priority of salvation, which is why this was the first gate rebuilt. And I pray that all who hear this sermon will also see the priority and need for their own salvation as well as others. A person must be saved first before they can pass through the other spiritual gates in their order as given, as I'm going to proceed along here. The sheep gate was also the gate that animals such as sheep were brought through for the animal sacrifices that were necessary for worship. The sheep gate was located on the northeast corner of the wall. So it started up here, and then we're going to work our way around. You know, I'll get back to the sheep gate. The second gate rebuilt was the fish gate. You read about that in verses 3 through 5. Nehemiah 3.3 3 says, But the fish gate did the sons of Hassaniah build, who also laid the beams thereof, and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. 
The fish gate represents Christians as being fishers of men, or at least they should be. You know, that should be the goal of every Christian to go out and try to win souls, you know. This gate is a reminder for Christians to tell others about Jesus and to bring others to Jesus, such as to bring them here to church. Jesus told the two fishermen, Peter and his brother Andrew, to follow him, and he would make them fishers of men. We can read about that in Matthew 4, 19. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Let us all become fishers of men, just as these two men were. Those who win souls are wise. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. A person cannot become a fisher of men without first having passed through the sheep gate of salvation. The fish gate was used, was the gate used by fishermen to bring their fish into Jerusalem to the market. But as I said, in order for you to become a soul, you know, you know, you need to be saved yourself. You know, like I said, before you can proceed along in this, this path through these gates. The third gate rebuilt was the old gate. You can read about that in verses 6 through 12. Nehemiah 3 6 says, Moreover, the old gate repaired Jehoiada, the son of Passia. And Meshulam, the son of Besodiah, they laid the beams thereof, and set up the doors thereof, and the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. The old gate was in the northwest corner of the wall, and along with the sheep gate and fish gate were the three gates on the north wall. Now some Descriptions or diagrams or drawings, or whatever, do show the old gate on the western side of the wall, just with what would be the northwest corner. So there is a little bit of discrepancy there, exactly, but it is believed that the old gate was named as such, since it was the old gate that was originally into Salem, or what early Jerusalem was originally known. Jerusalem was originally known as Salem. The old gate was rebuilt by the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem and his daughters as well as goldsmiths, apothecaries, which an apothecary was a person who sold and prepared medicines and drugs, such as like a pharmacist does today. And other diverse peoples were involved in this project. The old gate reminds us to get rid of our old sinful nature that is contrary to God and follow the old paths of righteousness. Romans 6.6 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. You know, once we get saved, we should be, that should be the goal of every Christian to every day to sin less and less and to get rid of that sin, become more like Jesus. The old man that is referring to here is our old sinful nature. Jeremiah 6.16 says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way, and walk therein? And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. As a Christian seeks to grow, they should have less sin in their lives, as I said, and they should be seeking the old ways of God. You know, that's, that should be the goal, like I said, every day. You should pray, Lord, you know, whatever sins we have in our lives, our bodies are different. You know, we all struggle with different things. But we should always try to strive to get rid of those and go back to the old old ways of righteousness, you know, and get rid of that old, old nature. And I just want to make one quick comment on the fish gate that I didn't mention. Then, um, you know, how we see the fish gate represents fishers of men. You know, even today, you know, then the fish symbol is often used to represent Christians, you know. So, you know, like I said, some of the stuff, you know, it's, it, it still be seen today. The fourth gate rebuilt was the valley gate. You can read about that in Nehemiah 3.13. The valley gate repaired Hennam and the inhabitants of Zenoah. They built it and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof and a thousand cubits on the wall onto the dung gate. Now the valley gate was on the western part of the wall and led to the Tyro Pohion Valley, which was also known as the Outer Valley, 
or some sources say it led to the Hindam Valley. You know, again, there's just different names between different sources and so forth, but basically, you know, led down to a valley. That's why it was called this uh, Valley Gate. And the Valley Gate represents us learning to be meek and humble. Many young Christians start all excited and on fire for the Lord as they should be. I mean, that should be when somebody gets saved, they, everybody, you should be on fire for the Lord to tell others about Jesus and want to learn stuff. Unfortunately, Christians don't tend to stay that way. And eventually they have a period where they're in low spirits and down in the valley. They feel as if things are no longer going their way and that God has abandoned them. This is the time that God really teaches us to grow for Him so that we can serve Him better. A Christian must experience the valley and its trials in order to reach the mountaintop. You know, Jesus said in Luke 14, 11, for, so, for whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Just as very little nature grows on mountaintops, much grows down in the valleys. Well, so do we as Christians when we are in the valley. Like I said, when you're down in, in the, the dumps, so to speak, you know, that's when God does his best work. You know, when you think, you know, that's one reason why it's so hard to reach rich people and stuff, because they think they don't need God because they have everything going their way. Life seems to be going all their way, you know, so they think they don't want God. Well, same with, you know, even somebody that is already a Christian, you know, they tend to backslide a little more, not be a strong Christian when everything seems to be going their way. That's why sometimes God puts us down in the valley to wake us up and say, hey, get back on the path and, you know, <laughs> you know, fix whatever the, the problems are going on, your sins that are in your life. You know, God knows we will feel as though we do, as I said, do not need him if we're always on the mountaintop. Being in the valley humbles us to rely on him and also helps us to have compassion for others who may be in the valley. You know, sometimes it's, it's easier to understand and have compassion for somebody if you've been in the same situation. You know, somebody that's had, you know, has lost a child, for example, it's easier for them to understand talking to somebody else that's lost a child because they've had that same situation happen or whatever. So sometimes, you know, God will put you in that valley just so that you can reach a lost soul that may be in a similar situation. The fifth gate rebuilt was the Dung Gate. You can read about that in Nehemiah 3.14. But the Dung Gate repaired Malkiah, the son of Rechab, the ruler of part of Beth Hatserim. He built it and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. Now this gate was on the southern part of the wall. The filth of Jerusalem or the dung, such as the rubbish manure, which is really that's what dung is, is manure, but you know, they, they included everything, you know, your, your rubbish, the manure, the dung, and any other waste was carried out of the city through this gate to the valley of Hinnom, where it was uh, burnt. You know, they would take all their dung and the, all the animals and, like I said, the refuse, and they would bring it through this the dung gate, and then they'd bring it down to the valley of Hinnom, and then they it was there was a continuous burnt pile. You know, that's where, uh, you know, they, they would call it Gehenna, you know, for uh, one of the words for hell in, in the Hebrew, then, you know, it was a continuous fire, which is like, you know, the, the hell and lake of fire would be a continuous fire. You know, this, this gate represents a reminder for all Christians to constantly be cleansing the sin out of their lives so that we may be holy before God. Second Corinthians 7, 1 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Paul himself said all things in his life were dumb, so he could grow in Christ. Philippians 3.8 says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. You know, everything that we have here on earth is, is dumb. You know, it, it, unless it's something that we have that's going to help us win others to Jesus or help us grow in Jesus. 
you know, basically it's dumb. You know, like I said, I understand you do need clothes and to keep you warm and you need food and a shelter and so forth, but you know, ultimately all that stuff, once you're dead, you can't take it with you. So just as our bodies were initially cleansed by the washing of our sins, away by the blood of Jesus at the time of our salvation, our bodies need to be constantly cleansed by prayer, reading the word of God, and having a healthy fear of God. You know, that's one of the things today, nobody has a fear of God. I should say very few people have a fear of God anymore. You know, they, they just, they mock them and, and blaspheme them and they just, there's no fear anymore. In the, you know, not only this nation, but in the whole world. <clears throat> a Christian has just gone through the valley gate and now God seeks to get rid of the dung in their life so they can proceed to the next gate of their spiritual growth and life. The dung gate was rebuilt by only one person. As each person must get rid of their own sin in order to cleanse their lives. You know, I can preach to you, but I can't make you get rid of your sin. And you guys can't make me get rid of my sin. You know, that's something that each and every one of us has to be convicted by the Holy Ghost. And we have to get rid of that sin, you know, with the power of God on our own. You know, nobody else can get rid of somebody else's sin. And a person, as I said, must let the Holy Ghost lead them so they will do the will of God. The sixth gate rebuilt was the gate of the fountain. You can read about that in verses 15 through 25. Nehemiah 3.15 says, But the gate of the fountain repaired Shalom, the son of Kohesia, the ruler of part of Mizpah. He built it and covered it and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. And the wall of the pool of Siloah by the king's garden and unto the stairs that go down from the city of David. Now the gate of the fountain was on the eastern side of the wall as all the rest of the ten gates will be located. All the rest are on the eastern side. The gate of the fountain is very close to the dung gate and leads to the Kidron Valley and was near the pool of Siloam. Or in this verse, it's called the Pool of Siloam. But in the New Testament, it's called the Pool of Siloam, which was used by the people for cleansing themselves before they entered the temple. You know, if you remember, they always had to wash themselves because, you know, God expects you to be clean and holy before you come in to worship Him. Water from the Gihon Spring entered the Siloam Tunnel, which led to the Pool of Siloam. And this is where the name of the gate comes from. The gate was close to the dung gate since it represents us receiving the Holy Ghost as the living water that Jesus promised and is represented in and, and is represented in the Feast of Tabernacles. A Christian in their walk after going through the valley gate gets rid of the dung or sin in their lives by going through the dung gate. And then goes to the gate of the fountain and receives the living water of the Holy Ghost as our faith grows and should flow living water to show the world Jesus. John 7, 38, 39 says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, originally, when you know, before the Holy Ghost came on Pentecost, like I said, Christians didn't immediately get the Holy Ghost. Today, once a person gets saved, then they immediately get the Holy Ghost. But this gate represents, like I said, the, the receiving of that Holy Ghost, so of the Holy Ghost, so that you can. You know, show forth Jesus within your lives and allow the Holy Ghost to work in your lives to let you grow. This gate was rebuilt by rulers and Levites, just as Jesus, who is the King of Kings, will rebuild our lives by us obeying the Holy Ghost. You know, when the Holy Ghost convicts us of something, He's doing it for a reason. That's how that's how we get convicted so we can eliminate the sin in our lives and then allows us to grow. And when you ignore them, you know, you can't grow that way. And if you keep ignoring them, 
eventually you're going to start hardening your heart some, and the Holy Ghost is not going to go around convicting you, and you know, you're not, it, it, you're basically you're not going to be able to get rid of that sin, because it's just, you're going to get to the point where you just, you know, ignore the Holy Ghost. Just pray that nobody gets to that point. Seventh gate was the water gate. Read about that in verses 26 and 27. Nehemiah 3.26 says, Moreover, the Nephinims dwelt in Ophel, under the place, over against the water gate, toward the east, and the tower that lieth out. Now the water gate was located near the gate of the fountain, as the two of them are associated. The water gate led to the Gihon Spring, which was the main source of water for Jerusalem. If you notice, the water gate was never repaired or rebuilt. All the other gates were repaired or rebuilt, it says. It never says the water gate was rebuilt or repaired. That's because the water gate represents the Word of God, Scripture, the Holy Bible, which needs no repairs. The King James Bible is perfect and will water our lives and cleanse us if we read it, study it, and allow the Holy Ghost of the gate of the fountain to convict us of our sins so we will obey the Word of God and grow. The Holy Ghost wrote it, Scripture I'm referring to, and will bring it alive for the Christian who wants to grow. You know, whenever you read your Bible, you should always ask the Holy Ghost to give you an understanding of what you're about ready to read, and it'll allow you to help you understand better what you're reading. And then, therefore, you can grow. Just read the Word of God. The Word of God will wash and cleanse us of our sin as we read it and absorb it. Psalm 119.9 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Ephesians 5.26 says, That he may sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now Ephesians 5 is referring back to the husband and the wife situation. And you know, like if one's saved and one's not saved, and by reading the word, you know, and by the, by the washing, you know, the, or the water by the word, then the, in this case was to talk about the husband over the, over the wife, but, you know, she can get saved by just, you know, him reading the word. Ezra read the law before the people in front of the water gate. This gate was chosen by God for Ezra to read here since it represents the word of God which the people wanted to hear. You know, and the key is the people wanted to hear. You know, that should be the goal of every Christian. The area near the water gate must have been large in order to have all the people here. The Word of God is also large as it has the answers to everything in life and also the answers for eternal life. Nehemiah 8.1 speaks of what I was just talking about with Ezra reading the law. I read the word rather. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. Now the eighth gate repaired was the horse gate. Nehemiah 3.28 says, From above the horse gate repaired the priests, every one over against his horse. Now the horse gate was near the horse stables of the king that were ridden out of Jerusalem for war. You know, whenever they got ready to go to war, the, the horses, you know, the, the, the cavalrymen, they would ride them through this horse gate. The horse gate along with the east gate and the gate in Mithcad were all close together and were located on the northeast part of the eastern side of the wall. The horse gate represents the fact that Christians, especially those trying to grow and serve the Lord, are in a spiritual warfare against Satan and his angels. Every Christian is in a spiritual warfare, whether they know it or not. But it is especially bad for those serving Jesus. As we read the Word of God, 
of the water gate and obey it, we will encounter greater spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now this gate should remind Christians to be good soldiers for Jesus and to always be ready and equipped to fight. Ephesians 6.11 says to put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So, you know, if you know if you're going to be in a spiritual warfare, it's just like a soldier going off to war, you know, now. You don't go unprepared. You bring your weapons, you bring your, all, all the things that you need to go off and fight that war. Well, it's the same thing as a Christian. We need to have our weapons that God has given us so that we can fight that spiritual warfare. And they're, you know, listed in Ephesians chapter 6. The ninth gate rebuilt was the east gate. You can read about that in verses 29 through 30. Nehemiah 3.29 says, After them repaired Zadok, the son of Immer, over against his house. After him repaired also Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate. Now, the east gate, as all of the gates on the eastern wall, overlooks the Kidron Valley and faces the Mount of Olives. Now, the east gate was the gate the people entered through on their way to go to the temple to worship the Lord and offer sacrifices. The east gate is called beautiful in Acts 3.2. Acts 3.2 says... And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. In Hebrew, this gate is known as the Gate of Mercy. This gate represents the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you remember, Jesus entered Jerusalem through the East Gate on Palm Sunday during his triumphant entry. The East Gate was sealed closed by the Muslims in 1540, and a cemetery was put in front of it to try and prevent the return of Jesus. Ezekiel prophesies of this in Ezekiel 44, verses 1 through 3. Then he brought me back the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary, which looketh toward the east, and it was shut. Then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it, therefore it shall be shut. It is for the prince, the prince, he shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord, he shall enter by the way of the porch of that gate, and shall, shall go out by the way of the same. The day will come when Jesus will re-enter this gate at his second coming, after coming back to earth with all his saints, which are all true Christians, on white horses and touching down on the Mount of Olives. No cemetery or walled-up gate will present, prevent Jesus from opening or entering through the east gate as the triumphant king. You know, really, they, only, oh, they didn't realize it, but they only helped things, you know, to, to fill prophecy about the Muslims doing this. That, uh, you know, Jesus didn't want, when he already entered the gate, no man needed to be entering that gate after him because, you know, that gate was for him, you know, and he is the Messiah of Israel. And the East Gate should be a reminder for all Christians to long for the soon return of the second coming of Jesus which I do believe is not too far in the future. The tenth gate rebuilt was the gate Mithcad. Nehemiah 3.31 says, After him repaired Malchiah, the goldsmith's son, under the place of the Nethanims and of the merchants, over against the gate Mithcad, and to the going up of the corner. The gate Mithcad was located on the northeasternmost part of the wall, 
It was where the elders sat and judged the people. The gate Mithcad represents the Bema judgment seat of Christ, which all Christians must appear before to determine if their works will be burnt up or they will receive rewards and crowns from Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Only works done for Jesus with a righteous motive will count with all others being burnt up. You know, just because you're doing something for Jesus, you know, there are times that people do things in theory for Jesus, but they have ulterior motives. And God sees that, even if other people don't. And those works will be burnt up. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15 says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build up this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, which means be made known. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now remember, all Christians will appear, uh, appear before the judgment seat of Christ, you know, the Bema seat. But only Christians will be there, and you cannot lose your salvation. You know, you will get saved. You're still saved, but you may not get any rewards. All your works may be burnt up. You know, it says, as saved by fire. You know, there's many people that just barely squeak into heaven. You know, they, either they get saved on their deathbed or, you know, whatever the case may be, or they just have never done anything in their lives after their salvation. But, you know, they're still saved. They will not lose their salvation. You know, unlike some denominations and churches and individual theologians preach once you're saved you're always saved you cannot lose your salvation tradition says that David inspected his troops at this gate you know this is what Jesus will do with our lives at the judgment seat of Christ so let our lives shine for Jesus this gate reminds Christians to spend our time for the Lord for things that will count in eternity and not for the things that will be burnt up here on earth. And in closing, after the gate Mithcad, those repairing the wall and gates would turn back to the sheep gate. You read about that in Nehemiah 3.32. And between the going up of the corner under the sheep gate, repaired the goldsmiths and the merchants. Now this final repair was done by the goldsmiths and merchants. Goldsmiths work with gold, which is refined. Gold represents deity, and, go, and God refines Christians as they travel through the gates. You know, you will get refined if God allows you to be refined. You know, some are not going to make it through all these gates because they don't want to get refined. But by returning to the sheep gate, it represents us returning to the cross where our spiritual journey all started with our salvation at the cross of Jesus. This is a reminder for all Christians that their sins were washed away by the blood of Jesus at the cross and that we are now sinners saved by grace and not works. 1 John 1 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. And Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and then not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And may all who have heard this sermon be on this spiritual journey through these ten gates. If there is anyone here today or anyone who is listening to this video who has not passed through the sheep gate of salvation, May today be the day of salvation before it is too late. Father, we just thank you once again for this opportunity to just come and pray. And just, Father, we thank you that we were allowed to, uh, the time here tonight, to just worship you. 
Father, we just pray that each and every one here today is on that path, the spiritual path through each one of these ten gates. And Father, we just pray that we have learned something that we can go out and tell others about Jesus so they may begin that journey throughout these gates. And Father, we do know that your return is coming soon. And we do look forward to that, you know, even so come, Lord Jesus. And Father, we just want to pray for safety for each and every one as they travel home tonight. Pray that each and every one might be able to return here on Sunday. And Father, we just thank you for your son Jesus, what he did for us on Calvary. And we give you all the honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.